28 days later. An apocalypse of infectious rage. But post-apocalypse, what is it truly that threatens our humanity, our survival? How does societal despair shape the aftermath? It's chaos, jung -Kyu. Humanity is left grappling with this existential dread. The fabric of society, everything that was considered normal, just disintegrates. It's almost like diving into a beaker of acetic anhydride, ruthless and volatile. Chilling analogy, Olivia. That must feel like watching your entire world upend within a blink and then making sense of what's left. Exactly, jung -Kyu. Amidst this chaos, humans attempt to adapt the new normal. And it's incredible how survival mechanisms kick in. It's survival of the fittest. The basic principles apply. The economy, the cocoon, collapsing to nothing. It must be like throttling in the dark trying to conceive a system out of this anarchy. Can you imagine waking up to your job, your money, your assets having no meaning? Imagine the sheer terror of it. But also the incredulity. It tears apart one's sense of reality. That's it, right? There's this fragmentation of reality, grappling with loss of rules that held society together. It's a free fall. It's economic collapse mirroring society's descent into despair. What is the most startling immediate reaction you've seen, Olivia? Well, jung -Kyu, in Cloverfield, the wave of panic and chaos that sweeps over NYC after the monster first appears is absolutely terrifying. Seeing all the characters in utter confusion, running for cover, is quite shocking. That's interesting, Olivia, because in I Am Legend, Will Smith's character, unlike the mass confusion in Cloverfield, faces his apocalypse alone, shooting those infected, barricading his residence and taking his dog for hunting during the day. Yes, jung -Kyu. Each character's initial reaction is uniquely rooted in their individual psyche. It's like studying different reactions to an unexpected and powerful chemical reaction. These radically different adaptive strategies, given the similar apocalypse scenario, are telling of the diverse survival instincts harbored by individuals. On the same note, in I Am Legend, we encounter a striking contrast where money and assets, which were once valuable, are now worth nothing in the face of imminent threats. The character's survival depends solely on perseverance, strategic planning, and resourcefulness. Is this mechanism realistically effective, Olivia? Survival in such situations is reliant on quick adaptability, jung -Kyu. As a chemical engineer, if I were to find myself in a similar position, perhaps I may not be as adept at hunting or barricading as Will Smith's character. But I'd certainly have a comprehensive understanding of what I can utilize or invent in my surrounding environment based on my scientific acumen. Does this approach hold water in collapsed economy scenarios? In a sense, yes, Olivia. As an economist, I concur that anyone, with their unique skill or knowledge, could convert it into a vital asset in such a scenario. Skilled people might very well become the new wealth, considering the withered currencies and collapsed banking infrastructures. Now, Olivia, one very distinctive feature of Cloverfield is how they presented the apocalypse as an unforeseeable external threat. Couldn't agree more. It's fascinating how the monster is an unforeseen extraterrestrial dot force, disrupting the known laws of physics and chemistry in order to wreak havoc. From the immediate explosion it causes in New York City, to the biological parasites that fall off its body and infect humans immediately, it's evident that apocalyptic survival in such a scenario would require people to rapidly make sense of these unfamiliar scientific phenomena. And if we think about I Am Legend, how does the science in that apocalypse differ? Surely. In I Am Legend, the post-apocalyptic scenario arises from a deadly, genetically re-engineered virus. For a chemical engineer like me, it's quite gripping how they depict a manipulative cellular mechanism that was meant to cure cancer, instead, becoming humanity's doom. The scientific survival would depend on unraveling the complex biology of the virus, synthesizing a cure, and then, of course, mass distributing it to any remaining survivors. So while Cloverfield presents an external threat, I am legend. Apocalypse comes from an internal failure. What about 28 days later, Olivia? That's an observant distinction, Young Q. 
In 28 days later, a highly contagious virus called the Rage brings about the apocalypse. Here, the survival challenge is battling a very infectious, blood-transmitted virus, while also having to outsmart and evade the infected, who remain mobile and drastically violent. I'd liken it to facing a chemical reaction that's violently explosive and fast-spreading. An engaging yet frightening prospect for a scientist, don't you think? Indeed. Each movie showcases a different apocalypse mechanism, presenting unique survival challenges. An external invader, internal scientific failure, or a virulent infection needs socioeconomic adaptation as well. Wouldn't you agree, Olivia? Absolutely, Jung-Q. Each apocalypse calls for a blend of scientific understanding and resource adaptation. While science provides the basis for combating the imminent threat, socioeconomic adaptations cater to physical survival and navigating societal chaos. I Am Legend triggers an immediate social collapse post-apocalypse. You're right, Olivia. The surviving humans find themselves amidst chaos and lawlessness. The cultural norms we hold so dearly and the structured societies we've built could crumble almost instantaneously. Yet, every individual's reaction to this new world isn't the same. In some, we see utter fear and a breakdown of their moral compass. Others react to the situation with a sense of thrill and a determination for survival, acting swiftly, showcasing resilience. And what intrigues me is this notion of disbelief, a sort of denial or refusal to accept the reality of the apocalypse. It's quite similar to the reaction we often see in the financial markets when they're on the brink of collapse. The initial shock, confusion, and subsequent disarray in the market reflects the human response to such unprecedented events. Well, isn't that something? Financial markets and post-apocalyptic worlds, who would have thought of that parallel? While I can't claim a deep understanding of market behaviors, it's fascinating how our reactions to disaster scenarios are mirrored across completely different contexts. Absolutely. And don't you find it intriguing, Olivia, that despite the societal collapse, humans still try to maintain some semblance of order, some remnants of the past? That is an interesting point, jung -Kyu. Call it a desperate attachment to the normal or perhaps an evolutionarily coded survival strategy. But there's certainly something innately human about attempting to hold on to what was once known, even if it's ain't crumbling remnant of the past. 28 Days Later offers a glaring depiction of survival versus cooperation. Look at how the characters change and adapt. It's like science, survival of the fittest. Shuffle or die rapidly becomes the mantra of the day. That's a brutal outlook. But there's a relatability to it, don't you think? The same cutthroat spirit underlines instances of financial market crashes. Sadly, in a world stripped bare, our true colors show. Some fight tooth and nail, some cooperate, and others? They find a darker, twisted middle ground. Olivia, what's your take on the impact of such rapid transitions on our psyche? Honestly, young Q, it stirs profound changes and mental shifts. Imagine our senses abruptly thrust into overdrive, forcing us to engage with our deepest, primitive instincts. It's like a chemical reaction, an imbalance disrupting the normalcy of our daily lives. But I get your point about cooperation. We're social animals, after all. We have just as much potential for collaboration as clawing survival. Can you elaborate on how you've seen this in action? Cloverfield jumps to my mind. Its sudden onslaught of destruction and the characters banding together, pooling their strengths for survival. It's intriguing, the resilient nature of the human spirit, don't you think? We may revert to our primitive instincts in the face of danger, but we are also capable of great compassion and unity. Absolutely. It's a complicated dance between our innate fear and our capacity for empathy. Faced with an apocalypse, we see ourselves reflected back, stripped of pretense. I Am Legend shows this too. The loneliness, the despair, yet the perseverance. It's a haunting testament to human endurance. It shows that even when everything crumbles around us, we seek companionship, support, and maintain some semblance of what we once perceived as normal. So what happens when every bit of morality, every ethic we've ever known, is eroded under the weight of survival? 
I am legend forces us to consider this. I'm no ethicist, but even I grappled with the transformations in the character of Robert Neville, played by Will Smith. Huh, science meets philosophy. But I hear you, Olivia. I too was struck by Neville's transformation. Remember his ruthless killing of the infected, which, under normal circumstances, would have been unthinkable. But in a race against extinction, who's to draw these moral boundaries? And isn't it a chemical reaction of sorts? Not just in the literal, biological survival sense, but metaphorically speaking, too. Survival instinct catalyzing massive shifts in our moral compass. Twenty-eight days later, had another chilling portrayal. The soldiers in the movie, under Major Henry West, become dangerous, abusive. They go from protectors to predators. The rules they once stood by vanish. It's like watching a structured financial system crumble into chaos. Yes, and survival isn't always about physical adaptability. There's a mental psychological shift, core values realigned. It's fascinating, but also quite terrifying, how narratives such as these lay bare the thin veil of civilization we're wrapped in. How mere circumstances can alter our very being. Exactly, Olivia. Remember Cloverfield? HUD, the camera guy, initially a comic relief character, becomes our lens to the chaos. He is initially driven by courage, then fear. It's unsettling how people become flexible in their morals in such dire situations. While we wish these were just dramatic scenarios, it raises an intimidating question. Are our ethics only as strong as our comfort? Might the fine line between survival and savagery be as fragile as a balancing chemical equation in a lab? Might is right. Sounds a tad Darwinian, doesn't it, Junk Q? More like Hobbesian. It's the return of the state of nature where the strongest rule and the ethics of conventional society become irrelevant. Ah, uh, philosophy meets science. How accurate is this might is right notion? Do we have scientific evidence backing this survival of the fittest claim in times of chaos? Economic history provides numerous examples, like during the Great Depression, where the powerful became even mightier. But ultimately, these scenarios are only as realistic or fictional as the writer's vision. In I Am Legend, for instance, Neville, being the sole survivor, had to take on an almost animalistic persona to survive the infected. His military training gave him an advantage, almost enforcing the theory of the strongest surviving. But there are counter-narratives, Olivia. In 28 Days Later, we see the Major and his men end up overly aggressive, fueling their own demise. It shows might is right isn't always sustainable. Hmm. Interesting. So the might alone doesn't guarantee survival if it spirals into self-destruction. Whereas a balance of might and mindfulness, like in Neville's case, may ensure survival. Strength with a dose of tact. Perhaps that's the key. Balance. The very concept of bullying, which might is right, can devolve into dwells in the realm of imbalance. Its consequences, as seen in 28 Days Later, are perilous. So it's not merely about prosthetic strength or shooting skills. It's about strategy, balance, and moral strength that dictate survival in these narratives. Yes, indeed. After all, what strength without control? Post-apocalyptic narratives offer such thought-provoking takes on survival. Survival of the smartest, perhaps. The societal collapse in Cloverfield was sudden and complete. Indeed, the attack by the creature happened without any warning, leaving the characters understandably shocked and confused. Surprisingly, despite the initial chaos, we can see small remnants of order. For instance, Hud and his friends, in the midst of the panic, tried to stick together. It's a human instinct, isn't it, to band together in times of crisis? True, but isn't that similar to the concept of too big to fail in economic terms? In moments of crisis, larger groups may offer a sense of security, but they are also more visible and susceptible to failure. Ah, uh, an adverse impact that might not be immediately apparent. Great point. I Am Legend took a completely different path, didn't it? Drastically different. Neville had already established a solitary regime by the time we meet him. His daily routine was his coping mechanism, preserving the last semblance of human civilization as he knew it. And it wasn't just about survival. 
He was trying to find a cure, an interesting application of science for preservation, kind of like a societal rebirth. That's an economic principle as well. Survival isn't just about holding on, it's about rebuilding and adapting to the new environment. Which brings us to 28 Days Later, where we witnessed a combination of these scenarios. The Major and his men, trying to establish a new order, but eventually being devoured by their own animalistic instincts. It's like a failed economy. It started with a promise of rebuilding, but greed and power struggles led to its collapse. Viral infection versus alien invasion. Drastically different apocalypse scenarios, don't you think? Taking a movie like 28 Days Later, the virus, Rage, spreads via an infected person's blood, saliva, or other bodily fluids being introduced to a healthy person. This makes it a highly infectious disease, drastically reducing survival chances in densely populated areas. However, the survival strategy would revolve around isolation, avoiding the infected, and support the streamlined distribution of resources. That contrasts with an alien invasion, as depicted in Cloverfield. There, the creature or creatures hold the power. Humans become simply collateral. Here, survival strategies require constant movement to avoid these unpredictable entities, making resource gathering a recurring challenge. Right, and we also see two different types of societal responses to these scenarios. Humans fighting humans in 28 days later due to the contagiousness of the virus. Whereas in Cloverfield, we saw humans attempting to unite in constant displacement, almost like rats in a maze. Interesting perspective, Olivia. And these different responses can have a grave impact on survival strategies. Would you agree that the type of apocalypse can heavily influence our survival approach? Yes. The variations in survival techniques hinge heavily on the nature of the apocalypse itself. In the face of virulent infections, science and isolation become critical. Against larger, alien threats, group dynamics and constant mobility become vital survival factors. Each apocalypse scenario poses unique challenges that require tailored strategies. Cloverfield certainly takes a stark aesthetic approach to apocalyptic immediate aftermath. Yes, you can observe how the somber colors, dejected cityscapes, and ominous music combine to create an atmosphere of dread and uncertainty. It's a visual technique a lot of these movies utilize. The gray, ash-covered setting post-surprise attack in Cloverfield creates that crushing desolation. It foreshadows the struggle the characters will endure and creates a base where survival seems almost impossible. And then there's I Am Legend, showing a decaying, abandoned New York. It's a different approach, less overt but equally as haunting. It's silent, serene even until dark, devoid of people until our protagonist shows up. It's fascinating how the seemingly mundane settings like Times Square takes on an eerie unfamiliarity. Right, I hadn't quite looked at it that way. I guess it leaves room for the audience to imagine own worst nightmares. And the sound design can't be understated. It equally shapes our perception of apocalypse. 28 days later, for instance, it's anxiety seeping through the silence, broken occasionally by the shrieks of the infected. Or the echoing roars of the creature and the panic-induced rumble of buildings in Cloverfield. Perhaps what we're expressing is the way filmmakers employ these elements to communicate the impending doom, the struggle, the survival in the face of hopelessness. Cloverfield depicts that initial shock of apocalypse with its high-scale destruction, and it's further heightened by the terrifying sound of the creature's roars ricocheting off skyscrapers. For someone from a physical sciences background like me, the authenticity was there, but it seemed a bit over the top. Good point, Olivia. Speaking of over-the-top, I Am Legend pushes it in the other direction with its silent eeriness. Manhattan reduced to a ghost town, silence punctuated by the far-off sound of Neville's hunting rifle. Chilling. The absence of human activity, illustrated through visuals for sure, but a large part of it was the sound, or the lack thereof. Right. Silence that amplifies the isolation. And then we have 28 Days Later, masterfully using silence itself as an instrument of fear, the soft rustling of leaves, the haunting echoes, that sudden break of silence by the screams of the infected. 
It's invasively unsettling. As much as I like to think that science can explain everything, here I am left confounded by the impact a simple auditory stimulus can have. That impact, as you mentioned, works at an emotional level, possessing a certain psychological potency. In film, sound and visuals function together, creating tension and fear. Do you think the impact is a bit different in these kinds of narratives, because each tries to establish such stark and different post-apocalyptic realities? Seems like it. There's chaos, silence, ambience, all engineering a sensory experience, a reality, that signals danger. If anything, the believable ambience they create gives reason for their strong effects. This brings back to me an age-old debate. Would the film be as effective without sound? Better leave the suspension for the audience to decide, right? Survival dynamics seem to dominate the immediate aftermath in these movies. Chemical instances in I Am Legend illustrate survival of the fittest in an intriguing way. But does the portrayal of survival realism concern you, Jung-Q? I find that troubling, and it could be a reflection of our societal fears. Using I Am Legend as an example, it seems that in the midst of chaos, hierarchy loses meaning and anarchy dominates. What's your take on this, Olivia? I Am Legend showcases this with Neville as a solitary leader. He's the last man alive in post-apocalyptic Manhattan, but he's not immune to emotional distress. Despite his scientific knowledge aiding his survival, the emotional tolls of isolation are irreparable. Jungkyu, how do you think economic systems function in such isolation? Economics would go into a freefall, with no formal economic system in place. In the brutal race for resources in survival situations like in Cloverfield, it's hard to imagine an established economic system. In 28 Days Later, the military portrays survival of the fittest in the cruelest form seizing power by force. This transformation in societal norms is alarming. As a scientist, I can't entirely decipher this behavioral transformation. Can you shed some light on this, Jung-Q? Well, from my standpoint, this shift is due to the breakdown of established societal norms. Becoming the fittest to survive means different points of dominance. Economic wisdom, however, can't predict this shift. For instance, in 28 Days Later, the military tries to seize power forcefully, but their plan collapses. Looking at the portrayal of despair and hope within these movie narratives, it's a stunning contrast. We see the desolate, desperate, and despaired nature of humanity at the brink of extinction. How do these feelings shape the characters' reactions, Jung-Q? These emotions, they act as fuel for the narrative. The levels of desperation and despair vary across each movie, for instance, in Cloverfield, the characters are largely motivated by fear and a desperate hope. They navigate through rubble-filled streets, hoping to save a loved one. In contrast, I Am Legend, Neville's despair is almost tangible, leading him to take extreme measures in his pursuit of a cure. And what about from a scientific perspective, Olivia? Well, hope and despair, in essence, are feelings and feelings are triggered by chemicals within our body. In survival situations, adrenaline, a survival hormone, gets released. That's the science of it. However, the psychological impact can vary person to person, circumstance to circumstance, and this variety is well portrayed in the movies. Jung-Q, do you think hope and despair play a role in economic dynamics post-apocalypse? Most certainly. In a collapsed economy, resources become the currency, and their value vibrates based on the levels of despair. Desperation can lead to a surge in their demand, driving up their worth. However, hope can nurture a sense of order, possibly leading to fairer resource distribution. In 28 Days Later, we see a brutal instance where desperation for control leads to unconscionable decisions. Your thoughts, Olivia? I suppose we can't underestimate human resilience. Amid despair, hope serves as a beacon of light, however bleak. It drives characters to find potential allies, seek out scarce resources, or even relentlessly pursue a scientific solution for their survival. Jung-Q, how do these narratives influence our reality? These post-apocalyptic narratives are warnings, Olivia. They reveal to us how easily societal order can collapse when hit by cataclysmic events. 
they highlight how despair can overtake our moral judgments. Yet they also illuminate that flicker of hope, keeping us from succumbing to our fears. We must understand and prepare for crisis scenarios while building resilient systems. Considering cinematic techniques and storytelling, Olivia, how would you analyze the aftermath portrayed in these narratives? Great point, Junk Q. Cinematic technique is a potent tool filmmakers use to reinforce the feeling of devastation. One technique frequently used is visual symbolism. Would you agree? I do. Give me an example. A primary example can be seen in I Am Legend, where empty streets and dilapidated buildings serve as constant reminder of the plague that wiped out humanity. The once thriving metropolis, devoid of life, visually sets the stage for Neville's isolation. Ah, isolation cues the audience into Neville's despair, a stark contrast to the chaos captured in 28 Days Later. What other techniques used to pump up tension, Olivia? Cloverfield relies heavily on its shaky handheld camera technique. It puts the audience right in there, making the calamity feel immediate and personal. Additionally, the decision to keep the threat mostly unseen, lurking in the shadows, does wonders to heighten suspense. Suspense ramps up the tension. Hard to achieve in a post-apocalyptic setting, I presume? Certainly. It's a complex interplay of elements. But these movies manage to instill fear of the unknown, of what lurks in the dark, of impending doom while also showcasing survival or the attempt at it against all odds. What strikes me looking at this is our fixation with materialism, Young Q, and how it's essentially meaningless in all these scenarios. That's riveting. We place so much value on money, luxury, and material possessions, only to realize they're redundant when survival is at stake. Makes you think, doesn't it? Faced with an apocalypse, our chemical knowledge or resource management might be more important than our bank balances and belongings. True. But doesn't the chaotic aftermath, these collapsed infrastructures that we see painted so vividly, indicate that culture and civilization hold more intrinsic value than we realize? Without a doubt. It's a poignant reminder of what we risk losing. Yet don't you find it intriguing how in most of these narratives, people resort to fundamental human instincts? It's as if the societal norms and constraints just simply evaporate. Survival instincts, one might say. Yet I can't help noticing the significant void left by a functioning economy. Considering I am legend, though the money is worthless, there seems to be some sham form of trading. That's an interesting observation. As if the intrinsic instinct to barter still survives, despite the world as we know it being in ruins. Isn't it fascinating how intrinsic traits win over learnt behaviors in crisis? It brings us back to the basics, primal instincts and survival. In essence, humans adapt and keep moving, however grim the circumstances may be. Being human, we endure.